Hello and welcome everybody to our shared worship. It's so good to be with you all. Um, joining you from all the different uh, congregations in our grouping from Kemne and Echten Midmar, Cluny Monimusk, uh, Blair Duff Chapel of Geary and Kintor. Did I miss out anybody? Kemne, did I say, say Kemne? You said Kemne. <laughs> Hello everybody. <laughs> it's so good to be able to do these services together. Um, and uh, we're going to have a quick whip around to see what's happening in the different churches before we head off to worship. So Sheila, I'm going to start with you. What's happening out at Echten Midmar? We're doing, we're doing well, thank you. We started singing on Sunday, which was great, and it was great to welcome the organist back. So, and it's actually harder than you think, singing behind a mask. I discovered, but nevertheless, it, it was great just to have different music. Well, this, this week, by the time we get to Sunday, of course, we will have had the next of our area group meetings. We have representatives from Echten Midmar joining those from the wider area grouping on Thursday of this week. And we're really looking forward um, to contributing to that and to beginning to plan a way forward for developing our relationships. So we've got a lot of enthusiasm. Um, there are lots of questions, I know, along the way, but we're looking forward to, to being part of that process, I think. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Sheila. Yes, it's uh, good to be part of that conversation too. Um, Ewan, what's happening in your neck of the woods? This coming week uh, is actually the last week of mainly music, the indoor group. We have a mainly music indoor group and a mainly music outdoor group. And I think the outdoor group are continuing for a few weeks yet, but the, this will be the last of the indoor group. So it's been it's been great to see the, the group restarting in the village hall and the, the families gathering and enjoying it. So that finishes. But as that finishes, we're now planning for our mainly music and Sunday school presentation service. We're not holding it in the church. We're holding it in the garden of one of the teachers. Uh, and it's right up on the hill. Uh, and I was there yesterday planning it, sitting outdoors with papers, in quite a strong breeze. So we hope on the 4th of July, it'll be a decent day, but I think we have alternatives for that. So that's something that we're looking forward to. So there'll be the church service that Sunday. And then afterwards, we're gonna have a small service outdoors with the children and then a, a party in the grounds of the, of the person's house. So that'll be something for fun. But apart from that, the rest is just taking over now as we sort of move towards the joint services in July and August uh, between Clooney and Manimask. That's lovely. Thank you, Ewan. Sounds like fun. Um, Fiona, what's happening in Kemney? Well, over here in Kemney, things are kind of ticking on as, as, as normal. Uh, mainly music has, is, is under preparation for restarting in uh, August. And um, we've got the, some of the church services in person have kind of gone into abeyance for a little while, but as soon as they are back in, uh, we will be making sure people are aware of, of what's going on. And it will, of course, continue to be the, the booking system there. Um, and also this morning, um, I am leading worship at uh, Blair Duff and Chapel of Geary on Zoom. So if you are... Um, if you have just switched on to this and you would rather do a Zoom, then you can switch over to Blair Daft Chapel of Mary, uh, Zoom instead. Uh, plenty of options uh, this morning. That's great. Well, I wish, wish you well with that as well. Uh, Kintor, I can tell you that uh, we have, we're planning our um, annual uh, church picnic. Um, we have been doing it usually on Father's Day, but today, this Sunday is Father's Day. So, um, uh, so we've decided to do it next week, just so that dads can spend time with their families uh, on, on this Sunday. Um, but uh, the idea is to, to have an outing where we can be together at a distance. We're not going to police to make sure that you stay on your picnic blanket. Uh, but as long as everybody uh, stays safe, um, and that'll be part of, of what we do. The other big excitement for us is that we're moving towards our summer services in July. And that's a great opportunity for all sorts of uh, different people from the congregation to be involved in leading different parts of the services. Um, it's, it's not just an opportunity for me to take a very long extended holiday, uh, although I will be away for a couple of weeks, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's really aimed at getting more people involved in, in helping lead worship. So that's what we're looking forward to. But for this Sunday, we're worshiping together online and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Let's go and worship together. Good morning. 
and welcome to all members of the joint churches represented here today our guests and visitors, especially those from further out in the world as we marvel at the technology which allows us to join together. In these fine days, I enjoy spending time outside and also marvel at our living world with its rhythms and beauty as the sunshine and warmth and rain make plants grow for beauty and food for both us and the animals around us. I was reminded of a poem called The Gardener by John Osborne, the Somerset farmer, who writes in very simple but a very meaningful way, and I'd like to share this with you now. I once dreamt of a garden uncared for, overgrown with brambles and weeds. Then the gardener began to transform it, attending to all of its needs. The first phase was to clear all the rubbish, enabling the flowers to survive, for the beauty was all being stifled but with care could all come alive. He pruned all the shrubs and the fruit trees and at times seemed quite ruthless to me, but I'm sure that he had the vision of what I was not able to see. Then to my surprise, he spoke to me and gently began to explain that if I invited him into my life, he would do exactly the same. I'd help you to clear all the debris away, all the things that you're troubled about, any grudges and unwanted items, the things you can well do without. Then you'll find your life like the garden is with peace and beauty adorned, as the flowers add grace to the garden, so your life will be gently transformed. For I am the gardener whom Mary met on that first resurrection day. I'll help you and never forsake you, and I'll lead you, for I am the way. Let us call to worship. Reading from Psalm 19. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth. And their words to all the world. Let us pray. Loving God, you made this world marvellous for us to enjoy. You gave Jesus to be our friend and to bring us to you. You send us your spirit to make us one family in Christ. For the beauty round about us, the seed time and the harvest, our life, our health, our food, we appreciate and know they are sent with your love. Allow us to find peace in the world, to leave our busyness, clutter of thoughts and troubles, to find calmness, tranquility and purpose with you in our lives. The rhythm of seasons, of new birth, death and recreation. All these speak so clearly of your love, your power and your beauty. Within the myriad colours of a butterfly's wing, you share the exuberance of your love. As we go through this week, please allow us to remember your love in everything that we see. Amen. For our first hymn this morning, let us praise God by singing from CH4, number 160. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven.
Our first reading today is from the book of Joel. Chapter 1, reading from verses 1 to 4, following into our second reading, also from the book of Joel, reading from chapter 2, verses 28 to 32. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children. And let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. And moving to chapter 2, verse 28, the day of the Lord. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. To his name be all glory and praise. In the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. When people of this and future generations look back on this time of pandemic, when it is all but past, as I'm sure it will be at some point, or at least when we have learned to live more fully with it, I wonder what the, the history books will say. Will they pontificate about this plague and what we've lived through? Will it be interpreted in different ways by different people depending on their background or their understanding? Will it simply be a statistical account of how many people sadly have lost their lives, have been infected, have suffered? Will there be a political slant about leadership, about international cooperation? And I wonder how long it will be until we are fully on top of COVID-19. For I'm confident that we will at some point do that. At least I hope and I pray that that is the case. I'm sure the history books will have accounts from the famous and not so famous about what it was like to live through COVID. There will be UK reviews of how our political leaders dealt with it, how medical staff coped through it, the lasting damage it did to mental and physical health, the amazing breakthroughs in the technology and the vaccinations and the techniques used to allow nations to share the whole story of lockdown. Some might argue it came from China. Others might say it was a disaster waiting to happen. Some might say, and I'm sure some will say, it was sent by God to encourage us to change our ways by becoming more international rather than more independent countries. All of these will be something for history. But we must learn from them. And we must realise that mistakes made because of lack of knowledge can never happen again. We must learn from them and move on. This morning I want to look at the prophet Joel and see what we can learn from this very short book, only three chapters long. But I think it can teach us 
and inspire us in these days. I chose to have read two passages from it. One not that well known, I suspect, and the other so well known, for I'm sure it is read each year at Pentecost. In preparation for this sermon, I read a number of commentaries, four of them in fact, and what I can tell you about this book is that experts don't agree. According to my cross-section of scholars, the book was written anywhere between 850 BC right up until just, up, just around 400 BC. It was either the basis of many of the other prophets that copied its work, or it took passages from many of the other prophets into its work. Joel might have lived in or near Jerusalem. He might have been a priest or a temple prophet, or he might have been something else. You might see a pattern there, because we don't really know. There's so little information in this book that allows us to make factual statements about it. In one of the commentaries I read, I did find a quotation from John Calvin from the 16th century, that famous reformer. He wrote, As there is no certainty, it is better to leave the time in which he taught undecided, and as we shall see, it is of no great importance. Sometimes it's important to have the background or the situation being addressed by the prophet or any other biblical part, passage. But in this case, it makes no difference. Because m much of the apparent uncertainty lets us look at it with fresh eyes. How does it impact upon us? What we know, all we know, is that the word of God came to a man called Joel, who was the son of Pethuel. We know nothing more. Not a thing. We don't know when the word came to him, where the word came to him. There are a number of people called Joel in Scripture, but this Joel is only found here and in one other famous passage that I've alluded to, quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost. What we do know is the author experienced a great natural disaster in the land. A plague, as it were, of thousands and thousands and thousands of locusts that destroyed and devoured the land and the food it would produce. And sometimes it's easy to overlook the devastation, but imagine you're an agricultural society who depend on the food you grow every year to sustain and nourish you when devastation happens. We're seeing it in parts of Africa now with with the, the horrible droughts that's going on and the people struggling. But this was not caused by drought. This was caused by infestation. Locusts spreading and spreading and eating. And the prophet challenges the people to learn from this experience and not to forget it. He asked them this question, one I've asked myself a few times this last year. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. But tell them what? Are we just telling them for telling sake? That was a question I asked myself in my first reading. And as I've said, in time people will review what we are living through now and hopefully learn from past mistakes. So maybe that's what the prophet meant, that we have to learn too from that story. And the images that he uses imply, to me at least, that he was an educated man. They portray the mighty and wondrous horror of the situation. A nation has invaded my land, he wrote, a mighty army without number. It has teeth of a lion, fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruin my fig trees. It is stripped off the bark and thrown it away, leaving the branches white. Nothing is left. And if that was not vivid enough, later on he'd make an even more dramatic description of the swarms that block out the sunlight. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountain, a large and mighty army comes. Never is such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. I don't know about you, 
but one of the effects of COVID-19 has to make me realise how powerless I am. We are against a microvirus that spreads and lives and causes disease and death. All the money and power in the world could not defeat this virus, at least not in the early days, when we shut ourselves off from our neighbours and our families in that first frightening lockdown, when we allowed ourselves an hour a day to walk outside. How could such a thing happen, I asked myself. And what is it? all this science and technology that we have at our disposal today, not able to do something about it now. Imagine what it was like then, two and a half thousand years or more ago, facing a swarm of locusts that darkened the day, the fear that it would bring in the resultant death and destruction that followed. And the prophet used this experience to try to bring the people back to God. To him, this was judgment in biblical terms. The call has often been the case was to repent and seek God in such times. The people are called, repent, come back, worship God for his help to get through this terrible time. We too have been praying quite a lot over recent months, bringing us through this terrible time. But the prophet recognises it's not just the words. It's the heart that must change. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he rel relents from sending calamity. The prophet tells us that God's anger is not to last. That the behaviour that led to that calamity, if you turn, when you have turned away from God, that's the result. So re repent, seek his forgiveness, and he will bless you. I think that in all the work of the prophets, this call to repentance in the Bible, we see God forgives. In the Old and New Testaments, if we are truly sorry. Let the priests who minister before the Lord, we read, weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. According then to the prophet, after bleak times, which he said was the response or judgment on the people by God, God responds to fears and repentance positively. And what was true these many years ago is still true today. I like Joel. He does paint a bleak picture of plague of locusts, but through it there is hope. This isn't the way of, for people of faith. That after the dark night of the soul, there is the dawn of the new day. And what a day and what a dawn he promised. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The people have lived through a terribly dark time. They have nothing else but God to give them hope, so they pray and they, they repent, and God responds, and the Spirit came upon them. True repentance swings open the door for the Holy Spirit to flood our lives. If people had not truly repented of their sins, then they would not have been blessed with the Spirit. God only comes to those who seek him. I stand at the door and knock. He said, he doesn't kick it in. 
but waits for us to open the door of our hearts for him to enter. And the result is witnessed in changed hearts and changed lives. Someone once said, and I don't know who, I copied it from somewhere, but I've lost the reference. It's always been God's desire to bring his divine presence among his people to become real and accessible to everyone. I wish I knew the context rather than just a saved quote, but it speaks to me after a time of darkness, that God wants us all to glimpse the light of hope after dark days. And God wants that light to show up God's hope as the people of God to us. I will pour out my spirit, said the prophet. Pour out. I love that. Not drip it on or dispense it according to your worth. I will pour out my spirit. He's so generous with the gift of the spirit. And it's everyone gets the same measure. They don't, as we know, get the same gifts. But they get the same measure as it's poured out on them. And you and me too. And this outpouring of the Spirit breaks down generational barriers, young and old. We struggle to find ways of being an intergenerational church. We talk about all-age worship, but Joel tells us that the Spirit breaks down generational barriers, for the old men will dream and the young men see visions. This outpouring of the Spirit breaks down gender barriers, we can claim with justification that the Bible is very patriarchal in nature, that women are often denied the rights and responsibilities that men had in pre-Christian times and many years after Christ came. But the prophet speaks about the gift of the Spirit being offered to both men and women. And it's worth noting that Jesus spent a lot of time with women and I don't think he ever meant them to be second-class citizens. And our church, though, it took many, many years, probably far too many years, to come round to this way of thinking. Finally, I listened to the Spirit with the ordination of women to the eldership and later to the ministry of word and sacrament. And thank God for that. It breaks down economic barriers. As the Spirit came, not on the wealthy, but to the hearts that repented, so that the rich and the servants alike would be blessed, so that everyone is part of the salvation story. Joel lived through a terrible time, but from it he showed better times ahead. To me, this prophecy is a word for today. We are living through strange times indeed, but take heart, for God is with us. And we should take comfort from the word of God through the prophet Joel. And I will close with them. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen.
And now let us offer our prayers for the world to God. Let us pray. God of the rich and the poor, of the powerful and the vulnerable, we pray for the leaders of the G7 nations who met recently, for the people they govern, for the people of other nations they can support, and for the world they can protect through their decisions. May wisdom be planted, generosity grow, and cooperation flourish. We pray for a growth in resilience, awareness, and togetherness across all the nations of the world as they continue to tackle the COVID pandemic, as they confront environmental issues, and as they reach out to communities crippled by need war, and natural disasters. May integrity be planted, urgency grow, and healing flourish. We pray for the church in this place and around the world as we seek to serve those around us, to reach out to those in trouble, and to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. May faith be planted, compassion grow, and hope flourish. We pray for those in the charity sector who seek to support those in crisis, to feed the hungry, to embrace those displaced by war, to protect wildlife and, envi and the environment and the planet we call our home. May trust be planted, resources grow, and lives flourish. So we pray also for our own communities, for those who have been bereaved, the lonely, the ill, and the dying. And also for those living close to abuse, addiction, and despair. May love be planted, understanding grow, and wholeness flourish. Let us continue to pray using the words that Jesus gave to us. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen 
go now in peace to seek and to serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love today and always. Amen.